Welcome to Mistara, and it's time to fess up. When you started playing D&D, who was the first action star you based a character around? A lot of people wanted to be Conan the Barbarian, the Dread Pirate Roberts, Robin Hood, Etienne of Navarre, Arthur, King of the Britons, or Queen Almathea from Barbarian Queen. Okay, nobody wanted to be her, but I've already used Arnold, so I didn't want to double dip and use Valeria, despite Sandal Bergman giving me one of my best interviews of my career, though that was 30 minutes of her talking only about her time with Bob Fosse and how that man was a living god. Regardless, people like to roleplay characters they like. It's always been that way, and we want to be our idols. But not me, some of you are saying. All of my characters are completely original, and I never stole any ideas from outside sources at all. Yeah, and I watch Angel White's lingerie lowdown for the gripping plot. Regardless, if you ever wanted to play Mako from any of the good Conan the Barbarian movies, here's your chance. I'm Mr. Welch, and today we're talking about the Hakomen of Ethengar. Hakomen only ever appeared in the Ethengar Khanate back in 89. They're the Wizards of the Steppes and they fill a specific role in the Ethengar society, though they really aren't appreciated. Feared, honored, and placated, yeah, but not really appreciated. Outside the Khanate, they're almost unheard of. They resemble no wizards of any other cultures. They still follow the rules for wizards mechanically, but they certainly don't act like traditional wizards. One Hakaman doesn't even resemble another Hakaman most of the time because of their unusual customs. In Ethengar, magic is a powerful tool, but one that is greatly feared. The Khans look for any edge they can get over rival tribes, and wizards are one of the best weapons they can wield. To prevent internal conflict on a scale that would destroy the tribes, long ago it was declared that the Hakaman belonged to no tribe. They follow their own code, taught to protect Ethengar instead of a single man. Hakaman work alone most of the time, but they will join with a small group if they need assistance. Because of their unique spell scraping system, working together with other Hakaman to research a spell is often pointless. When a child in Ethengar demonstrates an understanding of arcane arts, they're given to be raised by the first Hakaman the tribe can find. This is often when a Hakaman comes to visit and a child understands the sigils on a wizard's clothing or is able to copy the words of magic by just listening to them. If a child is suspected of having arcane powers, then they will be tested by the Hakaman, usually the one visiting. If the child is confirmed to be able to wield magic, the nearest Hakaman capable of taking on an apprentice will be summoned to take the child. Not every Hakaman is capable of training an apprentice at any given time. If they're currently on a quest, or they have other apprentices, or they have some sort of responsibility they can't get away from, then the Hakaman will pass along the message. Training apprentice Hakaman is very important, but only if the training can be done correctly. The length of time to become a Hakaman is determined entirely by the apprentice. The faster they grasp magic, the faster they will be sent on their own to serve the land and its people. No apprentice will be released if they're not ready, doing so is a grave offense for an established Hakaman. The apprentice will be taught to live off the land, basic spells, and the secrets of the spirits. While Hakaman are familiar with spirits and will frequently converse with them or seek their counsel, they're not tied to them like spirit shamans. To the Hakaman, the spirits are another resource, like a library or a scribe, not a being they swear allegiance to. Any deal between a Hakaman and a spirit will be concluded at the end of their meeting with no future debts owed by either individual. Once the apprentice is declared ready, the Hakaman will simply leave. There's no great ceremony. They aren't introduced to the other Hakaman. They know their own, and that's all that there is to it. The new Hakaman is no longer part of their old tribe, instead living outside of Ethengar culture until the day of their death. They will assist where they can, be it helping tribes survive adversity, making sure that herds are protected from monsters, or stopping outside threats before they become too powerful. Hakaman are taught to prioritize the danger, something the other nomads don't understand. To a Hakaman, protection of Ethengar comes first. If allowing people to die to prevent a greater threat is required, they won't even blink. Since they own few possessions, Hakaman only take what is absolutely necessary. One of the biggest differences between Hakaman and wizards is spell books, as the Hakaman don't use them at all. There's barely any trees in Ethengar to begin with, making getting paper difficult. Instead, they use sigils, icon they stick on their clothes or add to other possessions. Each sigil represents a different spell, and the Hakaman can memorize their spells by staring at the sigil in the middle of a meditation. The knowledge that the sigil holds is then transferred to the Hakaman's memory just like normal spells. Hakaman create new sigils once they gain knowledge of a new spell. Only the Hakaman who inscribed the sigil can benefit from it, as each Hakaman has their own specific sigil for each spell. The knowledge of the spell is within the Hakaman, the sigil just unlocks it. Powerful Hakaman will have sigils all over their clothes, as well as numerous personal possessions. If a sigil is destroyed, a Hakaman can recreate one, but it does take hours to replicate. Possibly the one feature the Hakaman are most famous for among the Ethengar is the practice of adopting taboos. These are restrictions that the Hakaman claim to give them power. They also make the Hakaman rather eccentric, even for their own people. Simple taboos can be things like not cutting their hair, never riding a horse, only eating meat, or not willingly touching other people. As the Hakaman grows in power, the number of taboos increase. More powerful taboos require the use of magic or prevent normal social activities, such as talking. 
Later taboos can be harsh, like prohibiting your feet from touching the ground, requiring you to travel through magic, or never speaking except to cast spells. Due to these taboos, most regular Ethengar give Hakaman a wide berth in everyday life. The people that seek out the Hakaman the most are either Khans or Spirit Shaman, who understand their connection with the Arcane and how they benefit Ethengar. The Khans recognize the power magic brings to their armies, and what it does to the humanoids and monsters that threaten the tribes, while the Spirit Shamans understand how to utilize magic to improve the lives of their people. The Spirit Shaman are often confused with Hakaman by outsiders, but no Ethengar would ever mistake one for another. The Hakaman are under no obligation to help someone if asked, but will provide aid if the situation requires it. It is within the Hakaman's right to refuse a trivial request for aid, or one that just serves the interests of the individual Khan. Harming a Hakaman who refuses a request is unheard of, as it will bring down the wrath of all of the Hakaman nearby for violating one of the most sacred tenets of Ethengar society. Anyone who violated this law would be hunted down by the Hakaman, with no one providing him assistance or even wanting to get close to him, for fear of being caught in the blast radius. If a Hakaman agrees to help, the assistance will only be temporary. The Khan will present his idea on how to handle the attackers, monsters, natural disaster, or whatever else the threat is, and the Hakaman will then decide how to handle the problem. Sometimes they will go along with the Khan's plans. Sometimes they will suggest a change to it, and other times they will go off and do their own thing. In that case, they will address the problem, but without the help of the Khan. Sometimes they believe the Khan's plan is bad and will just get people killed. Other times they realize the Khan doesn't understand exactly what he's facing, and the Hakaman will deal with it to avoid getting warriors killed needlessly. Often the Hakaman doesn't think the Khan fully understands what he is facing, and they will go off to seek more information on the threat before making up his mind. In that case, they will return to the Khan with the information, give them the full extent of the problem, and then come up with a new plan based on the newly acquired information. Hakaman are rarely found outside of Ethengar. They're places to defend the nation, and that is best done inside the borders almost all the time. But in a few situations, the threat is external, or the nation's need overlap with the safety of another land. In those cases, the Hakaman will seek out assistance abroad, or just head to the land where the danger exists, without informing anyone in Ethengar or in the land of his travels. The Ethengar don't like it when a Hakaman leaves the nation, but they understand Hakaman never do anything without a reason. While they may question his actions, they will never question the wisdom of their magic users. The independence of the Hakaman is paramount to them. While the tribes may wage war against each other or raid their herds for power, a Hakaman answers to no Khan, not even the Great Khan. They might assist a Khan to defeat a horde of humanoids, and they may aid the same Khan multiple times, but once the danger is passed, they will return to their solitude until they are needed once again. A Hakaman might be asked to assist one Khan in particular, only for a different Hakaman to show up and offer assistance. This is often the case when a Khan needs a specific type of help, and the Hakaman asked cannot provide it but knows of one who can. Again, the Khans in these situations do not hold the refusal of a Hakaman against them, trusting in their wisdom. Hakaman rarely meet in the wild, but the Great Khan has created a pavilion for them in his golden court where they can converse in private and in a small degree of luxury. It's not opulent, but it provides the Hakaman with everything they need to rest and congregate with others of their kind. In return, the Hakaman help police the Golden Court and use their magics to make the Great Khan's court as impressive as possible. They do not do this as a way of paying back Moglai Khan, but more of a way of saying thank you. They're free to leave at any time, and they're free to enter whenever they arrive. They are left alone by the guards that normally stop all visitors to the court. For those thinking about infiltrating the Golden Court dressed as a Hakaman, the DM needs to quickly remind them about how bad an idea this is, as Hakaman can instantly recognize who is one of their own. Hakaman tend to act impulsively when it comes to dealing with others. Part of their dangerous reputation is the habit they have of turning people that offend them into something unpleasant. People who request trivial boons from a Hakaman risk spending no small time as a dog or an insect. Other Hakaman like to teach lessons to various Ethengar by using charm spells to get them to perform a task they otherwise wouldn't do. Many of the Hakaman do this for their own personal amusement. Sabak, a powerful Hakaman who personally serves as chief advisor of Mogli Khan, is infamous for causing all sorts of trouble at the Golden Court by enchanting warriors to perform deeds they normally wouldn't do. One scout was nearly torn apart by horses as punishment for him entering the yurt of the female scouts. Only last-minute intervention saved his life when Sabak was seen floating above the scene laughing uproariously. Hakuman are not a common sight in Nastara, even in Ethengar. To outsiders, they're almost a curiosity, acting seemingly at random, talking to things that don't seem to be there, and being powerful enough to defeat a goblin war party on their own. To the Ethengar, they represent the guardians of their nation, spellcasters that are used like weapons against the enemies of their tribes, but almost as dangerous as the threats they oppose. They can be a total culture shock for people who are not familiar with Mongolia, but for the people that want to play them, they do get to channel their inner Mako. Next up on Welcome to Mastara is the Guilds of Derekin. They have nine of them, each with a different location, different specialty, and their own problems. They make the gold flow, and they're always jockeying for position. 
And that's going to be the 249th Welcome to Mastara officially uh, next week, so I need to do something special for the next one after that. But until then, let me tell you of the days of high adventure. <laughs>